Welcome to PayPod, the show that features thought-provoking interviews with leaders and entrepreneurs in the payments and financial technology industries. From credit card processing to Bitcoin, we cover it all. So if you want to know what's happening right now in the payments industry, stay tuned. Now, here's your host, Scott Hawksworth. Hey, everyone out there in the world of payments and fintech, welcome back to PayPod and buckle up because we have another excellent episode for you today. Today, we are going to be talking about how to effectively market an ISO in 2018. And joining me to help explore this is Michelle Geraci, who is VP of Sales with Transaction Services, and she knows quite a bit about sales. So Michelle, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me today. For sure. Now, to start us off, can you tell us just a little bit more about how you ended up in the payments industry and working at Transaction Services? I've been in the industry for quite a few years. It's going on almost 20 years, and it was an accident. You know, I didn't grow up saying, I want to sell credit cards. Um, sure. <laughs> fell into my lap. I started when I was, oh, you know, like 25, 26 years old. And my cousin worked at, I started in the industry at First Savings Bank. Mm -hmm. And just kind of like as a receptionist, floater, doing whatever they needed. And then I started in our documentation department, which we had all the incoming applications were done. So from there, I worked my way up in the company to, you know, head of that department. And then ever since then, been moving around, you know, I was at Monero Solutions, I was at Card Systems, SignaPay, and then most recently, I've been at Transaction Services for a year. Wow. So bottom line, you've been in the payments industry for a while and, and been a lot of places. That's awesome. Yes, and worked in many different departments. So I've seen a lot of just different aspects of, you know, front of house, back of house, sales, support, supporting agents, supporting agent banks. So yeah, I've, I've done pretty much everything. Sure. I mean, the industry, there's just so much in it. So it's, it's so great that, you know, you've been able to see so many different sides of it. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. So for those who may be unfamiliar, what exactly does Transaction Services do? Well, we are a full service processing ISO with our own proprietary gateway, which makes integration into any POS or software possible because we have our own internal integrations team. This is the first time I've ever worked for a company like that. I've worked for companies where we outsource that sort of thing. Like we outsource the gateway, we outsource. So integration was really not possible. Mm -hmm. But with TRX, it's very exciting because if you build it, we will come. You know, like <laughs> if, if, there, if anybody's willing to integrate with us, we have the technology and the team internally to make that happen. So your agent, you know, if they bring us an opportunity, let's say with the POS system, or something that we might not do today, if they're willing to integrate with us, we can certainly integrate, which is how a lot of our existing integrations that I know we're going to talk about further has come from, just needs that have arisen that we have been able to meet because we have that structure internally. That's awesome. This is one of the first companies I've heard of that has all of that together. So that's that's really an advantage. We are definitely a one-stop shop. So everything was built, everything that we have and again, this is unique for myself too, all this time, we built it. So mm -hmm. our CRM, every gateway, our CRM, our boarding process, our residuals, everything is in one place. So whether you're a sales agent or us on the team or a merchant, we all go to the same place to log in. The merchants go to the same place if they need to run a sale or if they want to look at their batches or their deposits. It's one simple solution. That's awesome. And that kind of leads to my next question here. ISOs have struggled in recent years to offer products that differentiate themselves from the thousands of other run-of-the-mill merchant service providers. And transaction services has taken a deep dive into a few niches in order to really differentiate themselves. And I'd like to talk about a few of these and get your read on how well they're working from a marketing perspective at attracting clients with margin and differentiating transaction services. Sure. So first is cruise lines. You guys are targeting cruise lines. Yep. First, how did you decide to target that market? And second, what do you offer that differentiates you guys from, say, you know, a run-of-the-mill first data shop 
And third, how do you get in front of these types of clients and has it been successful? <laughs> yeah, the third one's probably going to be the hardest. Well, this goes back even prior to TRX days. The guys that started TRX, they a lot of them originate from a company called EPX. It takes a long time. I have to tell you, it's not for the faint of heart. You know, you're just not going to get in for in front of Caribbean cruise lines. Yeah. It takes a long time. Like we started with a cruise line called Paradise Cruises, which is basically kind of like a booze cruise through the Bahamas. You know, it's sure. more of a couple day cruise, you know, maybe three or four days. Um, and we actually just added a second ship. So that started even prior to transaction services. And then what happened was these cruise ships, a lot of them have a software internally inside of the ship called Fidelio. So that is what happens when you're making charges inside of the ship. Well, we have integrated with that Fidelio software. So that's where like you say, what makes us different from processor A, B, C, D out there? Well, they don't have that integration into that Fidelio software that our gateway has. So what happens is that Fidelio software talks to our gateway, so we're able to do the surcharging, which is usually what goes on on these cruise ships. So think of it, I like to think of it as a floating restaurant. Ah. For some of them, we do some of the reservations, but the sweet spot that we like in the cruise ships, which is traditionally higher risk, but if you're just doing the in-cruise, you know, you're buying drinks and whatnot, trinkets from the gift shop, that's all retail. That's what we have integrated into the Fidelio software. And also another important thing is our system can do incremental authorizations, which means that, again, you're on a cruise ship, you might authorize your card for $100 here, or maybe you're going to do another $50 off here. We're able to increment that, which I guess not all systems can do, but ours can, which was important to the Fidelio folks that were able to do that. Wow, that's awesome. That's how we started. Now, again, how do you get in front of those people? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a bigger question. You know, how do you answer that? Well, you know, I guess because we have some cruise ships already on our books. So if you have an industrious, I have some PowerPoints and we have some marketing materials. We have the referrals where if an agent says, you know what, I want to try to go after this, or maybe some smaller cruise lines to start, we have that history. And we have that referrals, you know, hey, we can talk, you know, we can put you in contact with this person at Paradise to let you know how the surcharging goes, how our program has been. That probably would be the biggest in for an agent. And again, the marketing materials that I can provide to them so they don't have to recreate the wheel. I can give them a presentation here. Go, go. If you if you can get in front of that person. I will support you and here's some marketing. We can make it look slick and put their logo on it. And I've done that in the past with other agents with some, you know, accounts that they want to go after. Absolutely. So it's, it's like, you're, you're not necessarily going in cold. You're like, Hey, here's, here's the proof in the pudding. Like we've done this. Yes, exactly. And if the cruise ship has Fidelio, which is a, fairly kind, I don't want to say it's the only one out there. It's not, but it is a fairly common software that's in cruise lines. If you find out that they have one, that then you're like, oh, hey, we're integrated. We can do surcharge. That's your perfect end to get into that cruise ship. Absolutely. So another one is self-service parking lots. And it's the same deal. You're targeting those kiosks that you can pay for parking in a paid but unattended lot. Correct. And you know, why that niche? What, what are you offering them and how are you marketing to them and, and how's that working? Well, they can, again, it's like if you build it, they will come. They came to us. You know, Scheiden mm -hmm. Bachman is now. So what Fidelio is to cruise ships, Scheiden Bachman is to parking garages. So they're a very well-known name for the systems that are in those parking garages. So they came to us because they wanted to offer surcharge. And now you're talking, you know, nowadays, cash discount and surcharge is all the buzz. But a few years ago, this was uncharted territory. Sure. So they wanted, you know, they saw the potential savings. You know, we're talking for some of these, like we have the Oakton parking garage, hundreds of thousands of dollars it can be annually to these parking garages. So they came to us wanting to integrate, which we did. 
And so if they have a Scheidenbachman, that's not like we can't do it if they don't have them, but it makes everything so much easier. So we sure. integrated with them. And so we use the Verifone. It's the UX 300. Is It's just a little slot that goes into the harbor. So when you go and you're taking a parking ticket, that big piece of machinery, it's mm-hmm. the UX 300 that just gets it's the slot that just goes in there, takes the credit card piece. So that's all integrated into that hardware. And so parking garages is a no brainer for a surcharge program, because if you're going, let's say you're doing airport parking and you're parking your car there for three days, are you not going to do it because there's a 3% surcharge? Of course you are. You're still going to do it. (laughs) Right. And also a lot of parking garages, a lot of times that's an expensable item. If you're a businessman parking, you know, or maybe your work is paying for your parking there, that's something again. So most consumers aren't going to care. And even if they do, most of the time you're at a stadium, let's say, you know, you're going to a Cubs game, Mm -hmm. Park Chicago, you know, you don't care if you're going to pay a little bit extra to park in that parking garage that's across the street from the stadium. So it's a fantastic vertical for surcharging. Absolutely. So if I could maybe sum this up, it sounds like so much of your your guys moves into these different niches has been logically driven. Like, Hey, why wouldn't we do this? And also knowing like, Hey, here's what we have. Here's what we've developed in house. Here's these integrations, these things we can bring to the table that just make this such an easy partnership to pursue. Absolutely. And going back to, I just thought of another thing for the agents where like, how can they do this? You know, like specifically with parking, I'm sure cruise lines have it too, but there's always parking shows all over the Mm -hmm. country, which we attend sometimes. But if an agent wanted to, you know, even get a booth, And go to one of these parking shows and, you know, represent TRX and say, hey, we have a solution that works for your non-attending. They can do that as well and get some good leads. For sure. Now, you've already mentioned this a few times, surcharging. And I saw an article where you were quoted as saying surcharging is, and a quote, the wave of the future in the payments industry. That's correct. And you guys offer merchant surcharging solutions. For those unfamiliar, can you briefly explain what that is and how it differs from, you know, traditionally priced merchant services and then talk about how you guys market that? Sure. No. Again, surcharging, we've done it for a couple of years. So surcharging just it's in the same realm as like the cash discount, but why it's becoming so popular is over the years if you've been an agent in our industry for a long time, the margins, it's a race to zero. The margins are getting lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. Just because merchants, you know, it's more competitive. You know, merchant, I remember when I started 20 years ago, everybody was leasing a terminal. Agents made money on the lease of a terminal. The margins were huge. Also, the buy rates from Visa and MasterCard, those were nothing. Those were minuscule to what they are today. So the surcharging came about where okay, so how can we recoup some of these fees that are going up and up and up for credit cards? And I think that the general population does not understand how much merchants really have to pay for them to allow you the luxury of using your credit card. You know, it's, right. it's the merchants that are paying for that. And especially with the rewards cards, you know, rewards cards also weren't around as they are today, you know, American Airlines, United, Hyatt, Hilton, everybody's got a rewards card. Who pays for that rewards card? The merchants do by paying a higher interchange rate, you know, the highest actually that you can pay for those cards. So that's where surcharging came around where, oh, how can we recoup some of these fees? So what happens in a scenario, I'll take a very simple scenario of let's say it's a chiropractor and mm-hmm. the average ticket is $100. There's a couple rules and regulations we have to follow, which of course we do to the T to be completely in compliance with all the card associations. Let's say you have a $100 chiropractic session and mm-hmm. our surcharge rate is 3.50%. So the consumer is going to see on the receipt $100 3.50%, which is $3.50 for a total of one hundred three fifty. So what happens then at the end of the day, Mr. Chiropractor gets his $100, goes to his bank account, 
we take that $3.50. So we accumulate that all throughout the month. And when we get our bill from the processor, from the card associations, we pay the bill. And that $3.50 that we collected from every consumer, from every transaction, that's in a holding account, we pay the bill. And then what's left over, the delta of that is what's split between us and the sales agent. Why is that so fantastic? Well, because a rate of 3.50 or 4% or somewhere in there is a lot more profit built in than a merchant that's paying, let's say, interchange plus five basis points or something mm -hmm. you know, low like that. There's a much bigger spread and margin in what the agent makes. And then on the flip side, the merchant is no longer paying those credit card fees. So all our merchants pay are whatever they take for a debit card, which is way cheaper than a credit card. So to be compliant, you cannot charge a surcharge on a prepaid or a debit card. So our system, can the first six numbers of that credit card will tell us, is this a debit card or is that a credit card in real time? So when that consumer is checking out, if it's a debit card, that surcharge will not be added. So a merchant can save well, probably 80 to 90% of their processing fees. And what does the agent get? They get a much bigger residual because the split is so much greater. So is just emphasizing that that is basically the way you can market it? Like, hey, look at what we can do if, if you do surcharging here. Absolutely. For the merchant, it's savings. What are we doing for you? Well, we can do an analysis, you know, and usually you're saving merchants. You know, we're not talking about hundreds of dollars. We're talking about thousands of dollars. And in some cases, hundreds of thousand dollars going into the millions. For instance, mm -hmm. we're working on a car dealership right now, a string of them. And if they do surcharge for their locations, now take a car dealership with a string of 82 locations, we're saving them <laughs> millions, millions of dollars annually that just goes to their bottom line. It's pure profit back into their system. And with surcharge, you're giving the consumer a choice of plastic. The mentality, the switch from fees, you know, from free processing for a consumer to having to pay fees, but with a debit card, they can still not have to pay that surcharge if they don't want to. But if they're going to pull out their American Airlines rewards card, it still is going to be worth it to them in the end. How much are they getting in rewards versus how much the surcharge would be? On a small merchant, you know, $40, $50, $60, maybe not much. But let's say you had $2,000 of service done on your car. Well, that's $2,000 in rewards points. I take it. Sure. That's my, you know, whatever miles or your hotel. So it's a win-win for everybody, even a consumer, if they're, choices to use their debit card or their rewards card, they're still probably going to reach for that rewards card for the bigger purchase items. And merchants, again, for a little merchant, you might save them 500 bucks a month to bigger merchants where, again, you're saving them $2,000 a month. So it's a big win. Absolutely. And you mentioned um, you car dealerships, you're working on that. Um, are there any other types of businesses that, you know, you could maybe speak to who is receptive to it and maybe who isn't. Maybe there's merchants out there that you, you kind of bring this to them and they're like, whoa, I, I'm not going to surcharge my customers or, or anything like that. Sure. And I think the verticals service, think service orientated businesses. So the chiropractors, the dentists where it's a service to go there, you know, and most people, if they find a really good dentist, if they've got to pay an extra three bucks for their cleaning that insurance might be picking up anyways, chances are you're not going to go to a new dentist because of that surcharge. Right. What it doesn't work for is perhaps your convenience store or a subway. You've got a subway on five corners. Maybe you're going to be that guy, that consumer, well, I'm not going to go to that subway because they're surcharging me. Mm-hmm. But again, in those businesses, if you use your debit card, which most people are going to do for a small amount, it's okay. But getting back to your question, 
it's just widely more accepted in service industries. And that's in our portfolio, the chiropractors, the dentists, we have the parking garage, the cruise ships. Those are the people that are finding it a way more palatable for them. Um, funeral homes, car dealerships, those are the towing companies. Those are a few of our verticals where we have found success. And then you have your whole other realm of your home businesses so that people are coming in, like a mm -hmm. plumber, an electrician, HVAC, another great verticals. And quite frankly, those people, those industries, chances are they're doing it today. Mm -hmm. They're just not doing it compliantly. I just bought a furnace last year and they added a surcharge on. And if they're doing it not through their processor, they're paying taxes on it and they're, it's going against their, their bottom line. Right. So with us, we're collecting those funding so the merchants don't have to report that on their taxes and they don't have to report it as income. Right. So there's a benefit there. Yeah. So for your electricians and plumbers, you know, and that's, I sold my HVAC because I'm like, hey, you can't really be doing this. You're not compliant. So, you know, switch them over to a compliant program. And this way they're actually saving more money than doing it themselves. I'm getting a sense that so much of this is win-win. It's just yeah. about everybody just winning. <laughs> it really is. I feel that it is. You know, in, in consumers, it's a hard sell sometimes to, again, your local mom and pops, your local dive bar, that they're, you're going to add me, a, you're going to give me a service charge on this beer. That's going to be more of a harder sell. But so that's why I, when my agents say, who do I go after? It's all the people that I just named. You're going to go after the service related industries first, or I would call it like the low lying fruit. Those mm -hmm. are the people that you really should target. The owners of those businesses really get it. And those businesses, they're probably paying more for their credit card services because they're mm -hmm. probably going to be have a bigger percentage of rewards cards because it's more of a higher ticket. Absolutely. Yep. Kind of shifting gears a little bit, you know, Transaction Services is a registered ISO of West America Bank. And for those payment folks that may not know much about the role that a sponsor bank plays in an ISO's business, can you briefly explain how you two work together and then maybe tell us a bit about why you guys selected West America Bank as opposed to, say, Wells Fargo or some other? Sure. It's definitely a partnership and they are the most integral part of this whole thing because ultimately they are controlling the risk. So mm -hmm. when you partner up with a sponsor bank, it's a very long relationship and you have to, for, it's nice if you like them or if you know some of the folks that are at that establishment, but they're the ones that are paying the money. They're the ones that are taking the risk and funding the merchants before the money comes in from Visa MasterCard. So it's very important to vet out the uh, sponsor bank because you want a reliable mm -hmm. sponsor bank. You just don't want any flash in the pan. Now, so how we started, actually, it was, again, kind of a mutually beneficial when transaction services started and we were looking for a sponsor bank. West America, at the same time, was looking for an ISO with a TSIS settlement platform. So they wanted to get in the TSIS arena and we needed to have a TSIS sponsor bank because that's the only platform we have as opposed to like First Data or Payment Tech. Ours is just TSIS. So West mm -hmm. America was looking for an ISO to get into TSIS and we were looking for a sponsor bank that we can use. So it was a perfect fit. So ever since then, we've been working together. So you guys have a really strong online marketing footprint, but a lot of ISOs don't have either the technical expertise to just really succeed online. I'm curious, you know, what marketing channels are you guys focusing on today? And do you have any tips for what sort of merchant services marketing is effective in 2018? So I think that, again, going back to our gateway too, we have a hosted, we're able to do a hosted pay page 
So if an ISO, an agent is out there and they're wanting to, you know, maybe target some online merchants, maybe these online merchants don't have a website today. It's just being developed. Or if they have a website, they don't have a hosted pay page. We're able to set that up for them. Wow, I love that. And I think Wait, it I also even goes back itself. to what you were talking about. Like <laughs> Absolutely. Group. We it's also so have in, in showing the pay page, I should say. We also have hey, some look, shopping Here's how it can look. That we work mm-hmm. with that are integrated with our gateway. You know, there's a million shopping carts out there. And we have a few that are already integrated. So, again, you have that startup merchant that, hey, I need a shopping cart and a hosted pay page. We can help them out with that as well. But let's say it's somebody that's not integrated with us. Say it's somebody that has a shopping cart on somewhere else. They can still go through our system. It would just be what's called a stage only. So we still Mm -hmm. can do the process, the credit card processing, and they can still keep the gateway and the shopping cart or whatever they have, even where they're at. So we can help in two ways. We can do the processing for somebody who's already set up, or we can help a merchant with brand new shopping cart website functionality love it okay so can you peer into the crystal ball (laughs) where do you see transaction services in say three to five years are there any like long-term projects you guys are working on or overall goals that you can share things coming down the pipeline that you think businesses might really benefit from well I could tell you, I mean, we're only growing. We are only growing in terms, two of our integrations. So mm-hmm. in three to five years, each year we have an annual strategy session of what we want to integrate, what we're hoping to have. So each year, each calendar year that goes by, we just have more and more integrations. Like we're looking at getting probably by first quarter of next year, we're going to have a POS system available. So if agents, you know, they need to sell somebody a brand new restaurant POS, we're going to have that. So that Mm -hmm. is the trend. We don't look to stop. We're just going to keep going. We're going to be shortly too. again, probably by the first of the year, have an EMV mobile. We have a mobile solution right now, but it's not EMV. We'll have that. So we're just adding more and more services to our bag of tricks Sure. Agents to be able to offer. So in five years, my gosh, I can't imagine all of the <laughs> stuff that we're going to be able to offer to our agents and downstream to their merchants. Absolutely. Okay. So last question or group of questions, rather, we have a segment we like to end with where we do a fast five questions, rapid fire. Okay. Are you ready, Michelle? Oh my God, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Make a prediction about the future of payments that you expect will happen in the next mm, 12 to 24 months. Yeah, I feel like I should have a buzzer. Bing! Well, I think <laughs> it's going to continue in the trend and you're going to see way more of the cash discount or surcharging products. Just from the trade shows that I'm going to, those breakout sessions on surcharging it's like all the buzz. If you're going to the show, you need to be at that session. So I do think that each month that goes by, each year that goes by, so let's say if you were to talk to me a year from now, I think mm-hmm. it's going to be even more fold of as a consumer out there, you're going to see surcharging a lot more places than you see it today. Absolutely. So that trend is definitely going to continue. What's one cool piece of payment-related technology you've come across recently, unrelated to your company, that impressed you? Biometrics. So I came from the biometrics world, pay by touch, where it was paying with your fingertip, but now they're starting to do facial recognition. Now, imagine that for fraud. Wow. So, okay, so you're at a retailer, so you're going to have to go through a series of when you sign up for your credit card, facial records, you know, taking a picture, you know, pinpointing things on your face. We'll say that. And then at Mm -hmm. a retailer, you know, you're going to have a little webcam when you check out to see, okay, is this the person? Is this matching their facial recognition? That's a retail. I've seen that. But imagine this. Now, this, I don't think this is out there, but take that same technology for online payments. If you have a webcam in your laptop or a little camera, imagine what that would look like for beating fraud. If you are 
you know, you have a card holder and you're going online to eBay or whatever, if it's matching up to your picture, your actual biometrics of your face, what that would look like. Wow. So that I think is cool. And I think that that is definitely something that might be coming in the future. For sure. In the next five years, most Americans will make a purchase with either Bitcoin, Apple Pay, some other thing. Which one and why? I think Apple Pay. I think Bitcoin is still a bit out there for most of the consumers wrapping their head around it. We just talked about that the other day with a a group of people at the show. And there's a lot of people that still don't understand it. So I think Apple Pay, I think, and why Apple Pay too, because more and more terminals, the hardware that's out there, the readers, like when we come out with our mobile reader, it's all going to have that contactless technology in it. So it's like Apple Pay came up with it. And then all the hardware people and the processors have to follow. And so Mm -hmm. that's coming. So that I think is going to be more pronounced because the equipment's going to be out there in the world. You know, Apple Pay needs to, I think if they did some sort of like point system to give people some sort of incentive maybe for using, you know, Apple Pay, that would work as well for getting consumers to use it. But finally, the payments industry has to follow technology wise what Apple has created. And I think that that's, I know for certainly with us, we can do it today on our terminals, but like on our mobile pay and stuff, it's coming. So that's why I would choose Apple Pay is going to be coming more and more out there. Absolutely. So does does that help? <laughs> does that answer the question? <laughs> that does. That does. Only two more here. What's one piece of advice you have for someone who's considering the payments industry as a career? From where I started from 20 years ago, and I learned something new every day, and it's always changing. If I were brand new wanting to start, One thing I could recommend is the ETA, the Electronic Transaction Association. I'm sure you've heard of it. That's the big trade show for our business, the big to do. They have a lot of classes and they have something that's called a certified payments professional exam that you can take. So they have a study guide that goes along with that. I took it actually myself recently, and it's a very robust, detailed test that you can take. So I think if I were going to do this industry for the first time, I would look into seeing about taking some of those online classes or maybe even being a certified payment professional. I think you can learn a lot. They've got online forums at all the trade shows. They've got things. I think I would definitely start with taking in some of that. So you know some of the ins and outs, what's interchange. You know, how do you price these merchants? How do you get in front of these merchants? I think that would be invaluable for somebody. This is just stuff I've picked up along the way over 20 years, you know, from this one and that one, from this corporation. I think ETA would be a fantastic way for somebody to get started today. Absolutely. Last one. What's the best business advice you've ever received and from whom? So I have to think about this for a little bit. and. What I would say is a long time ago, one of my dear friends, and he's still my friend today, Jerry Julian, he's in the payments industry. He told me that whether it be a merchant, whether it be an agent, treat that person like they're the next million dollar account. So whether mm-hmm. it's a you know little merchant, maybe it's that little mom and pop nail salon that, you know, maybe other agents would say, I'm not going to give them the time of day. But then, you know, five years from now, they own a string of 10 nail salons, you know, or I had another experience where even the people in a merchant establishment, when you go and you're going to go cold call, let's say a merchant, maybe it's that bartender behind the bar that you strike up a conversation with, and he's not the owner, and he's got no authority with that business, but that bartender might own the next 10 bars of the future. So I'd say Mm -hmm. just really with everybody that you meet, an agent, and he might be a small agent or a merchant, just treat them, give them all of your knowledge and treat them like they're a million dollar merchant or agent. And I think you can't go wrong with that by giving everybody you meet the most 
of what you have to offer. I think that's great advice. Thanks. <laughs> I'll tell Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, I wanted to thank you so, so much for joining me today. This was really, really informative. Thanks so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. Absolutely. And for folks interested in learning more about transaction services, you can find them online. Uh, check them out at uh, trxservices.com. They've got a lot of exciting things going on. So definitely worth your time. Great. Thanks so much again. Take care. You too. All right. Bye-bye. So that's it for our interview today, which means that it is time to award our Small Business Organization of the Week. Each and every episode, we want to highlight business groups and organizations doing great work advancing the interests of entrepreneurs and small businesses, helping business people connect, being positive influences in their local communities, and so much more. These organizations are nominated by you, our listeners. So if you ever think of one you think deserves to be highlighted, don't hesitate to let us know. Send an email to scott at sorpay.com and we may just mention it. For this week, though, we are happy to award the NFIB Small Business Association. NFIB is the voice of small business, advocating on behalf of America's small and independent business owners, both in Washington, D.C. and in all 50 state capitals. NFIB is nonprofit, nonpartisan, and member-driven. Since their founding in 1943, NFIB has been exclusively dedicated to small and independent businesses and remains so to this day. NFIB was founded by C. Wilson Harder in 1943 and maintained its headquarters in San Mateo, California until 1992 when it was relocated to Nashville, Tennessee. Harder began with a home office and sold the first memberships to his neighbors. His vision was to give small and independent business a voice in governmental decision-making through advocacy. Since its early history, NFIB's agenda has been determined through a one-vote balloting process of its membership. NFIB has grown from Harder's for-profit entrepreneurial vision in 1943 to the non-profit national association it is today. If you'd like to learn more about them or discover membership benefits, which include savings on commercial and health insurance, credit card processing, shipping, office supplies, computer bundles, and more, you can find them online at nfib.com. Many congrats to them on their selection. Well, that's it for our show today. Thank you so much for listening. And if you like what we do here, don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes or whatever your preferred podcast listening platform is. We'll be back with another episode very soon. Thank you for listening to another episode of PayPod brought to you by Soar Payments. Soar Payments is a leading merchant services provider for e-commerce, high risk, and hard to place businesses. If you'd like to get the latest PayPod episode sent to you automatically, subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher, or visit sorepay.com slash podcast. Podcast.